Galilee to John of the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed it. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 through 17. All four of the Gospels recount the baptism of Jesus Christ, which really I consider to be one of the most underappreciated moments in the life of Jesus, that being his baptism. We can take this down just a little bit. It's from that moment on that, that Christ is thrust into three years that really will change the world, will ultimately change the world. Now, before I start, this is part one of Jesus Revisited. How about that little Twitter sermon intro? Come on. Luke, Luke Hill did the video, and I'll give you one guess who's whistling behind the video. It's Kai. That's Kai doing that song up there. Isn't that great? Look at the little whistling guy. So that's like the first all original, 100% music, video, everything, uh, original sermon intro. So I was blessed. We have some talented people here at 68, don't we? Amen. Um, so yeah, so this is uh, going to be eight weeks of us really exploring the life of Christ, the last three years of, of Christ's life, and, and revisiting some of the most iconic moments of Christ's life, and allowing those moments to speak to us and challenge us in some, in some new ways. And, and I, I just, I didn't do it intentionally, but I just feel like it's, it's not coincidence that we're doing the sermon series right now. As I've been saying, the church is moving into a new season. Uh, we're coming out of our five-year anniversary, and we're moving forward. And it's just imperative that we really look at the foundation. It's, it's imperative that we really think about you know, why we exist, which is Christ and Him crucified. Amen? Amen. Come on. Amen. And so um, I think this is going to be fun. It's going to be insightful. It's going to be challenging. Um, it, it, the eight weeks will take us right up to Easter. Isn't that scary? Um, eight weeks will be right the week before Easter, so the sermon series will end, and then Easter will be uh, Resurrection Revisited, and I haven't written that yet, but we'll see how it goes. God will give me something. Praise the Lord. Yes, amen. You feel my pain. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, what I'm excited about, the, the bottom line is, the life of Christ wants to speak to you. It doesn't matter how long you've been going to church, it doesn't matter... Maybe you, since a little kid you've seen it all up on flannel graphs or whatever. The life of Christ wants to speak to you. It wants to reach out across time, across space, off the pages of the Bible to speak to you. And he'll use whatever method he can use, whether it's the, me or a, a Twitter account. Jesus is tweeting. Come on. You can follow him at, at Jesus Revisit. That's a real Twitter account. You can go and follow um, all the updates on the sermon series. Or you can follow Pastor Kristen and myself. We'll retweet what Jesus tweeted. I don't know if that counts as tweeting or whatever it is. Anyway, um, you can, you can, you know. Anyway, the clip we just saw is um, in the passage we read is about the baptism of Jesus, right? And, and, it, that moment is such an incredible, imperative moment. We're going to revisit this incredible moment. This moment that changed history. Um, I'm just taken back with the importance by it. The first real public appearance by the Messiah. John the Baptist has been preaching about repentance, preaching about the Messiah coming, and then there he is. He appears. And, and John baptizes him in the Jordan River. And we're going we're gonna to talk specifically a little bit later about the, the act of baptism. But I want to focus here right at the outset at what happened immediately after. When Jesus comes up from that water. Because that's really the moment that changes the world. That's the, the moment that impacts us even today. It impacts you. It impacts me. The, the heavens open up. Uh, the Spirit of God descends as a dove. A, a voice says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. God himself testifies as to the divine nature of the human being standing in the Jordan River that day. Amen. God the Father in the, in the form of 
that voice, God the Son, there in the person of, of Jesus, God the Holy Spirit, in the form of that dove, together one moment, one, one, at one time, testifying as to the divine nature. And at that moment, the world changes. Amen. And it's incredible to think about God coming to earth, the divine coming and, and living amongst us as a man, and, and, and God testifying to that. And every person from that moment till this moment has had to deal with that. Everyone has had to come to some conclusion about who that was in the Jordan River that day. We've had to answer the question for ourselves. God told us who he is. This is my beloved son, whom I am well pleased. But then the question becomes, who do I say that he is? Who do you say that he is? And I'm just really taken back by the historical significance of that. When, when you think about it, every person really has to wrestle, has to come to some determination about who Jesus is. Because every person's impacted, in what, what, whether it's by the calendar or by some conflict around the world, who knows? Every person on earth is impacted by it. And it started really with the disciples. The Apostle Peter and the disciples are faced with the question. Turn in your Bibles real quick to, to Matthew chapter 16. I'll just read this to kind of give you some context. Everybody doing okay? Yes. Alright. Right. So let me come out and shake you up. Shake you up. We have to exercise. We need to do some exercises. No? no? Okay. Alright, verse 13. It says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And so they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Wait, go, Peter. Maybe you're not as flaky as the one's thought. Peter gives the right answer, amen? Listen, you, you could be here every week listening to my, my voice, hear me preach. You could come every week, sing great songs. But you know what? Today, this sermon series is about you having to answer that question. All of us, we all have to answer the question, just as Peter did, just as the disciples did. Who is this person, Jesus Christ? Who is he? And in 2013, we get some opinions about that, don't we? Just like in, in Jesus' time, verse 14, there were some opinions. When Jesus asked the disciples, who, you know, who are they saying? And then I'm like, well, some people are saying John the Baptist. Some are saying... Jeremiah, Elijah, they're saying you're a prophet. Well, you know, in 2013, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. People have all kinds of opinions about who Jesus is. They'll say he's a, he's a great teacher. Have you ever heard that? No, yeah. He's this great man of peace. Heard that as well, I'm sure. A great moral authority. A great prophet, a great man with a great message. We hear that a lot as well. But you know what? The scriptures don't leave those things open as possibilities. It's just not possible. And I want to read a passage from a book by C.S. Lewis called Mere Christianity. Most of you know who C.S. Lewis is, right? The author of um, the, uh, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Chronicles of Narnia. In this book, um, C.S. Lewis makes this very compelling, profound, logical argument that I want us to wrestle with a bit here today. And I want to quote from this book. He says, quote, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. This is the one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sorts of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic, on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or he would be the devil of hell. You must take your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great demon teacher. He has not left that possibility open to us, nor did he intend to. End quote. 
that C.S. Lewis is talking about the, the dilemma that all of us have to grapple with. If you read up on this on this book and this what C.S. Lewis is saying, they, they call this the, the trilemma, meaning that it's it's a three-sided possible dilemma, a trilemma. And, and that trilemma is was Jesus a liar? Was he a lunatic? Or is he Lord? Now, Pastor Dave wants to add another little leg to that dilemma. So it becomes four-sided, and that makes it a tetralemma. Big word for Pastor Dave, isn't it? Yeah. Amen. A tetralemma. And that is legend. Was Jesus a legend? Did he exist at all? Was he a liar? The things that he said in the, in, in, that we read in the scripture, are they, were they true or are they false? Was he a lunatic? Was he crazy, schizophrenic, mentally ill? Or was he Lord? The things that he said, were they true? And, and, and is he who he says that he is? Every person must grapple with those things. And all of them, even here in church, we must consistently wrestle with this tetralemma. Because if any of the first three are true, we're wasting our time here today. I love all you guys. It's cool. I love hanging out with students. I love hanging out with everybody else. But you know what? We're wasting our time if he's legend or liar or lunatic. We go be getting our chicken when he's ready for the Super Bowl. How many of you are rooting for the Ravens, by the way? That's pathetic. I'm not even going to ask who's rooting for the 49ers. Anyway. Patriots. Yeah. 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 But seriously, we're wasting our time here. If he's a legend, if he's a liar, or he's a lunatic. And so we must answer that question. And that answer must compel us to action. And here's a, a criticism of the church and of us. I think we live our lives, we act, we do church as though Jesus was just a great teacher. As he was just some, some great moral authority. We, we kind of live as though we're just fans of this bigger than life thing. This, this, this larger than life image or legend. But the reality is that the things he said don't leave that open to us. There's no room for that. Church, every person must come to the determination of who Jesus is. And that includes us. And we must respond to it. And like C.S. Lewis said, we should come with something that's not a possibility. Where his teachings good. Yes, they were good. They talked about peace. Yes, he talked about peace. But he also claimed to have the power to forgive sin. Amen. He claimed that he was God. He claimed that there was no way to the Father but by him. And those statements leave no room in the middle when you're trying to figure out who it was that day that was baptized in the Jordan River. It leaves no room in the middle. And that determination really should spur us to action because if we determine that he is who he said he is, then there's some serious things that hang in the balance. There's some serious consequences. Eternity hangs in the balance. So just for a moment, let's revisit some of these claims that Jesus made. This Jesus who changed history that day in the Jordan. And maybe, like I said, maybe you've seen these things up on final graphs your whole life. <clears throat> maybe, maybe you've been around church and you've revisited these, these couple stories we're going to read um, a billion times. I know I have. But you know what? Open your heart and look at them through this prism for a moment. Maybe you've never looked at these stories through this prism before of determining who he is, this dilemma. You know what? O open your heart. And, and, and let, let's look at it for a few moments. Turn in your, in your Bibles to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Now while you're turning there, let me deal with one blank of the Tetralemma. I'm not going to deal with this one too much. And that is the, the one that I added, legend. I added it because a lot of people I talk to, are you thinking around here on Tuesdays, Thursday nights, will tell me, you know what? I don't really believe Jesus existed. I think it's all some, you know, some fallacy or whatever. And I'm just going to kind of discount that here right now because I just, for me, I just don't believe that so many human beings throughout history, especially the disciples, Paul, Peter, those guys, would have been willing to be martyred and suffer such terrible, gruesome deaths for a legend. I just can't buy that. Yeah. I, can't, I can't believe that these guys would have fabricated this entire story and then been willing to face being eaten by lions and crucified upside down and beheaded and all of that stuff. 
death. So, at, at least for Peter and, and, and Paul, those guys historically documented, they, they, they thought this stuff was true. And so, to me, that completely discounts the legend idea. Is there, is there a legitimate lack of archaeological evidence to support the existence of Jesus? There is. But when I look at the martyrs, I say he cannot be legend. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And then the other part of it you have to deal with, to, to, to kind of deal with the legend plank, is you have to come to grips with what this is. Amen. You have to determine that this is historically accurate, this being the Bible, the Word of God, that this is God speaking to you across time, across space, through heaven, that is historically accurate and that it should be taken literally. Amen. And again, there's many ways to come to that determination, but I'll again point to the martyrs. You know how many people die for what's in this book? Yeah. I just don't believe people would die gruesome deaths for stories and fables. I just don't believe. I think of myself. I have, I've struggled being martyred for what I know is true. Amen. Give me a break if it was something I knew was false. Then I'd get like, you know, my head on the chop. Like, I'd be like, hold on. Maybe, maybe I made a little bit of it up. But they didn't. They were willing to go to their deaths. And so you have to wrestle with that and really decide, is this true? And is it history? Is what this says happened, happened? And you need to know here at CCA, we believe the Bible is historically accurate, that it should be taken literally, and that what it says happened, happened. Amen. Okay? And so if you struggle with that, you should come talk to me, and I, and I, can, I can go into it a little bit deeper with you. Now, so that discounts, for me anyway, the legend. That's how I kind of wrestle with the legend plank. Let's read Mark chapter 2. Um, we're going to start in verse 5. This is Jesus dealing with this paralytic. He says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Some of the scribes were sitting there reasoning in their heart, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus with themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, take up your bed and walk? <coughs> you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose took up his bed, went out in the presence of them all, so they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. So he heals this guy. But that's not the point. Amen. The point is that he claims the power to forgive sin. Even the scribes and the Pharisees call this blasphemous. Listen, no good moral teacher would make that claim. That is a claim to the divine. Amen. Now we get used to reading this stuff. I've read that story a hundred times. Sometimes we get numb to it. This is a dude on earth saying all the bad stuff you've done, I can take care of that. Amen. Now, I, 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 you just got to hear my heart here. I'm just, I want to use this as an example, but if you're around this property for any amount of time, I hear lots of people say that. Honestly, on a Thursday night, I'll, I'll be walking around here. There'll be someone talking to themselves over in the corner. I'll go up and say, hey, man, you doing all right? You get enough to eat? And they'll look at me and say, I'm Jesus, you know. And it's funny, but it's true. And they'll say, I, if you break me off, I'll give you your, your sins. What will happen? I'll, I'll say, dude, we're going to get you a plate of food. It'll all be all right. I love you, man. If you need something, let me pray for you. And I'll, and I'll walk away and I'll say, that dude's gets a friend. He's, he, he's obviously mentally ill. Right? If this were to happen to us in this day and age, someone were to come up and make the claims Jesus gave, we would just count them as a fool. What do we say about Jesus here? What category do we put him in? Is he a lunatic? Is he schizophrenic? Or is he telling us the truth? Look, turn to, to Mark chapter 14. Everybody doing all right? Yeah, yeah. You look shell shocked, like this crowd last night. Everyone saw the little Twitter intro about it would be lighthearted and nice. I'm going to hit you over the head with the Bible today. Awesome. <laughs> this is probably the most controversial scripture in all of the Bible. We're going to read starting in verse 5. Thomas and Jesus in a discussion 
here. Thomas says to him in verse 5, Lord, we do not know where you're going. And how can we know the way? Jesus says to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Jesus is telling us straight away, he's the only way. To he's claiming to be God. He is the only way to heaven. We are not the world. We are not the children. Not all roads lead to the top. Amen. Not all roads lead to God. And I tore this verse apart. This is what I, I spent the majority of my time this week looking at this verse, tearing each word apart, trying to figure out if it can be interpreted any other way. Because there are lots of people trying to interpret this a lot of different ways in 2013. Let me tell you something. There is no other way to interpret it. Jesus is saying he is the only way to heaven. He is saying he and the Father are one. So in effect, it's true, Muhammad won't get you to heaven. <laughs> it's true, being a good person won't get you to heaven. It's, a, it's true, Buddha or whatever it might be, the Kabbalah won't get you to heaven. And I don't know what, where you come from here today. Maybe you've been told your whole life that all roads lead to one. Don't be mad at me, I'm just a messenger. And put it again into context. What if someone were to ramble like this today? And if you turn, turn the pages a couple to, to, to um, John 16, Jesus says that, that people are in sin if they don't believe in him. Those are some outlandish claims. And if people made them today, we would, dis, we would roll our eyes and discount them. There's only one road up the mountain, and it's Jesus Christ. And so it becomes very obvious, very quick, this Jesus who was baptized in the Jordan that day is not just some good moral teacher. Amen. He is not some guru who taught about peace. He's either a legend, a liar, a lunatic, or he is who he said he is. He's the Lord. How do we make that determination? How do we come... Because, you know what? We all sit there and we're like, yeah, Pastor Dave, this is good. I brought my non-Christian friends here today. Don't, don't lie to me. I know. We all struggle with this sometimes in our heart and our mind. Coming to real faith. Really determining what this is all about. How do we come to this conclusion for ourselves? Lots of times we try to base it on the evidence. Right? I'm logical, analytical. Anybody with me? Anybody like to be logical and analytical? I'm, oh my gosh, I'm the only one in my life. Um, for me, A plus B equals C, and that's just the end of the story. Maybe we'll try to, 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 to find miracles, signs, and wonders. Right? We think that, that, that will prove it. You know what? In Jesus' day, they had plenty of miracles, signs, and wonders. He rose people from the dead. He, I mean, he did crazy, and they still crucified him. Don't tell me miracle signs and wonders will prove it. Some people go to church and and or they'll go to a meeting thinking, man, I want to feel God. The, God just zap me. I want to go just zap me, God. Yeah. They're looking for the feeling. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Listen. When you come off that feeling, you come down off that high, which is what it is. <laughs> that fix, so to speak. Real life happens, and then all of a sudden you're left with your wrestling again. You're left with trying to determine is this is it is it real? Because those things they, they 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 won't prove it to your to your heart. So what is the key? What's the secret? How do we come to the determination ourselves? How do we really wrestle with it? Well, we actually read it already. There's a little secret. Turn back to Matthew chapter 16. And this dialogue between Peter and Jesus. When he says, We do men say that I am, and the disciples say something to John the Baptist, Elijah, in verse 14, verse 15, he says something very critically. He says, But who do you say that I am? The question here today, first off, is not who do your parents say that I am? It's not who do your friends say that I am? It's not who does science say that I am. It's not who does your professor say that I am. It's not who does Pastor Dave say that I am. It's who do you say that I am. 
I think it's hard to admit, but many of us base our understanding of who Jesus is on somebody else's opinion. On somebody else's determination. Maybe your parents believed and so you believe. Or maybe your parents didn't believe and so you don't believe. Or maybe you've been told by somebody that this is all just one great myth or one great whatever. And so that's how you feel. At some point, other people's opinions just won't cut it. You have to answer the question directly for yourself. Who do you say that he is? And then, Simon Peter says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Flesh and blood cannot reveal this to you. Study and research can't reveal it to you. Only God in heaven can reveal it to your heart. Amen. It is something that happens by the supernatural power of Father God. Listen, the natural proof will just leave your head spinning. Watch the History Channel. It will leave your head spinning. It's cool, but it just will. You have to seek truth and allow God to reveal it to your heart like he revealed it to Peter. Stop trying to reason it out. Stop trying to get around it with your natural mind. Stop looking for the signs and the wonders. Amen. Listen, I believe in signs and wonders. We need them. Don't get me wrong. But if anybody had signs and wonders, it was the people on the Jordan River that day when Jesus was baptized. I mean, come on, the sky opened up. The voice was there. There was a light. There was a, there was a, a, a dove. If it were me, I'd be like, I'm following that dude. But nobody followed him that day. He went off the desert by himself. Signs and wonders aren't going to aren't going to determine this for you. It is something that has to be revealed to your heart because your emotions will play tricks on you. The truth about who Jesus is has to be revealed like it was revealed to Jesus. Now let me end with this thought. We've wrestled a little bit with this textual dilemma. Maybe you need to wrestle with it some more. I don't know. But once we wrestle, it does compel us to action. And that brings us back to Jesus in the Jordan River that day, being baptized by John. For me, the natural question that comes up when I read about Jesus being baptized is why? Do you ever wonder why? Why does Jesus get that? Why does he need to be baptized? What is baptism for? It's for the washing away of sin, right? It, it, it's so that you can be cleansed from sin. Jesus didn't have any sin. And so I think it's a logical question. Why would he need to be baptized? And lots of people have opinions, and I think they may, you know, they may be true. I, I don't know. Some people say, well, he was embracing his humanness and knowing that, that we were all going to need to be baptized at some point. Some, some say he's trying to set an example. Those may be true. But here's what, as I revisited this this week, that God showed, showed me and, and challenged me this week. Baptism signifies lots. It signifies, obviously, washing away sin. Romans chapter 6 relates it to us and, the, and Christ's death and resurrection, right? But it also signifies a radical change in direction. It, it signifies a change from one way of thinking to another way of thinking, from one way of life to another way of life. The ending of one life and the beginning of another life. Up until this point, Jesus had been a carpenter's son. Up until this point, he had been an Oli. He lived a quiet life. No one knew who he was. That was all fixing the change. And this moment signifies for Jesus that significant change in direction. That significant change in his life. He was leaving behind one life and embracing another. So as we wrestle with, who do you say that I am? And I'm dropping this on a room full of Christians. I, I know that. Maybe you need to consider a radical change in direction. Amen. Maybe you need to consider a radical change in the way that you think. Amen. And maybe that entails baptism. I'll just give you, give you what the advice Peter gave on the day of Pentecost. When people said, what do we do, Pastor Dave? What do we do, Apostle Peter? He said, repent, be baptized. That's the advice I'll give you. Repent and be baptized. Repent for the way that you thought. Repent for whatever it might be that tells you back. Whatever that, that way of thinking was. Whatever you thought about Jesus. Whatever a 
opinion you may have held, or whatever somebody else's opinion was that, that, that messed with your opinion, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to have baptism available here at each service. Starting next week. And you know what? You may have been baptized before. I don't care. The challenge is who do you say that I am? And when you come to that determination, I believe the next action is repent and be baptized. And I know for some of us, that may be a hard thing to do. Because we've been baptized. Well, I'm a Christian. I'm a pastor. I need to repent and be baptized. Yeah. If I'm going to have Kai come, Kai, please come. And, and the sermon's not over. Yeah. Worship today is part of the sermon. Yeah. And I want you to wrestle with this. I want you to come to some determinations. And, and, and before we... we